Give me one second. Um, okay, just doing a quick check. You can, can you hear me okay, Jessica? Okay. Noel saying, can we maybe get a better frame for the interpreter? One second. Okay. good to go. Okay. Um, well, hello, everyone. And welcome to the next conscious conversation brought to you by Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting. Um, my name is Gregory Allen Jatu Sindiana. And I'm really, really excited about our featured guest, mental health therapist and an art therapist, an educator and a movement mate, Noelle King, um, today. 
Um, Hello, everyone. Awesome. I'm going to um, uh, quickly introduce Noel by reading a little bit of their, their bio, if that's OK. OK. Um, so Noel King, she, her, hers, is from Little Rock, Arkansas. When she was five months old, she was adopted from Seoul, South Korea, by deaf parents. She graduated from Gallaudet University with a BA in psychology and a minor in studio art. Noelle got her first taste as a, a docent at the National Gallery of Art, which is an art museum in Washington, DC, where she provided American Sign Language gallery tours. She moved to Chicago for two years, where she graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago with a, um, with a master's degree in art therapy. Um, Noelle brought her passion in art history to the Art Institute of Chicago to establish the ASL Gallery Talk as a docent, which provides free art education to deaf Chicago residents every month. Currently, she lives in Boston, Massachusetts, and works at the Learning Center for the Deaf, um, TLC, or the Walden School, as a mental health therapist and art therapist. She works in a wide range of settings with clients who have diverse backgrounds and experiences and lifestyles. One of Noelle's deep passions is to work with the deaf and hard of hearing community and expand access to mental health services through providing various approaches to therapy, including art therapy. She's a doctorate student in expressive therapies at Lesley University, and her goal is expanding access to art education diverse mental health therapy approaches um, that includes art therapy and art um, network within the deaf community. But super excited to have you with us, Noel. Thank you so much for having me and that intro. I, it's a huge honor to be here today. So thank you so much. Um, uh, and if it's okay, I'm gonna start us with our first question. Sure thing. I did want to acknowledge where I am today. Uh, I'm in Massachusetts, Boston, and I want to recognize that I work and live on the land of the indigenous community here. The indigenous community is Nipmuc. The interpreter might be saying it wrong, Massachusetts, and uh, the Pawtucket tribes. Thank you. Thank you for that land acknowledgement. Um, and I can just say that I'm in um, the land of Piscataway peoples, otherwise known as Washington, DC. Um, so uh, my first question for you is a question that we ask all of our guests. And the question is, in the spirit of Ella Baker, who are your people? I really love this question. To think about who are my people, consider my ancestors, consider where, considering where I am today, uh, black and brown spaces, Asian communities, deaf communities, um, and all the people that I work with, all the people that I've met throughout my life that have come in and out, the ebb and flow of people in my life, all of these people are my people. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question I would love to ask you is, when was the last time you felt brave? I think that every day mm. I have to be brave. So there hasn't been a last time. As a deaf person, uh, Asian, queer, woman, all of those things, daily I have to show up and be brave in the spaces that I show up. I'm a trailblazer. Mm. And each day that I enter any type of space, I consider the deaf community as a art therapist, as a mental health therapist. 
And so for me, I would say that every single day, every single space I enter, I have to be brave. Mm. I appreciate that framing. I'm curious, as you are navigating, as you, as you feel like you have to continue to be brave, what keeps you grounded or what, what helps you get through moments that you feel like you have to hold that, especially as a trailblazer? It's a really good question. What keeps me grounded is thinking about the people that really need this. I feel inspired every day. It's what keeps me going, not just the children that I work with, but thinking about the future, thinking about the heart of the community and me giving my heart to the community, um, being vulnerable, genuine, keeping myself accountable. Uh, and the art, art keeps me grounded, finding balance within the art and then working within people every day on a regular basis. I can't imagine without having the community that I would be here. Um, if it wasn't for the community, I, I imagine that things might be different for me. I one thing that really stood out to me when we were initially connected and even in your response to this question um, is you talk about ac accountability, especially within a community context. Um, and I think that that is a word that I hear a lot. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of people, um, I think it's used in different contexts. And so I'm curious if you could share some examples of what does it mean to be accountable to you? especially in a, in a collective or community context? And how do you um, stay accountable? I love this question. And I'm glad that it's being brought up. Um, I think one step in accountability is recognizing our identity. I am a light-skinned Asian woman. Um, I cannot forget the diversity within the Asian community. Uh, there's, there's a spectrum, right? We have dark skin, light skin, um, and AAPI is included in all of that. Uh, I'm from South Korea myself, and I feel that I'm accountable in recognizing all the other communities. Um, I am adopted. I was adopted at five months old. And I know that there's some white culture that, that has made its way in, inside of me. Um, over time, I am accountable for unpacking that. Uh, and then two things come to mind. Um, I am deaf, I identify as a deaf person, um, but I can't, I, can't, I don't identify, I don't represent every single deaf person. We are so diverse, so robust. Uh, I am a part of the disability community. I'm a part of the Asian community. I encompass all of these things. And so when I look at myself, I do these check-ins with myself regularly on a daily basis to make sure that, that I'm okay. My rule of thumb is to do no harm within the community, do no harm to myself with my friends, colleagues, family. Um, so I have to do these constant check-ins with myself, being open-minded, open-hearted every day. Um, and, and realize that the community is evolving. Mm -hmm. We are in this together. We are walking this path together, um, listening to each other as we go. Uh, I feel very much accountable for that and recognizing marginalized people that are overlooked, neglected, forgotten. Mm -hmm. One thing that's coming up for me is um, as you are, um, responding to that question is, um, and I'm, that I'm really sitting with, is this kind of the role that we have um, in the accountability, like the, the self-awareness, the commitment to doing the learning and sometimes unlearning, which I think is harder work, but I, I'm learning is actually a big part of how we stay accountable in, in community. And um, I also appreciate like uh, making sure there's like a fine line too, in terms of like, 
diversity and representation and not necessarily wanting to speak on behalf of broader communities or being positioned to do that. Um, and what does it mean to have folks who are the most marginalized, the, the least represented, the least, um, uh, that have the least access to kind of use that role or use, use the access or the privilege or the opportunities that we have to be able to lift up um, even more people. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, feeling, feeling the grounding. Exactly. exactly. Um, and and that kind of that kind of leads me to my next question about the work that you do. Um, I know that as we talked about in your bio, you work as a mental health therapist and an art therapist with folks who have diverse backgrounds and experiences and lifestyles. Can you um, can you share an experience or two that has had a positive and lasting impact in your life and in your ongoing practice? I wanted to add uh, in regards to the last question for accountability. I think about people's voices that get ignored. I want to acknowledge that, um, that we're all working to be better humans, to create a better world, really, right? Basically, that at the end, that's what we want is a better world. Um, I want to be a good person. I want to do good in this world. And I want to be supported as well as support others, uh, whether that be different barriers, challenges, and whatnot. Um, so I just wanted to add that. And then the next question that you just asked me, um, I'm thinking. When I was an intern at a middle school, it was a K through eighth grade school that I was working at uh, as a, a master's student when I was in Chicago. Uh, I was on the south side of Chicago at the time. Uh, I was putting in a lot of hours at, at school, in the internship, working with the kids. Most of the kids wore black and brown kids uh, in the middle school, deaf and hard of hearing students. I was there uh, for about a year. The kids had never seen a deaf person using sign, uh, someone that didn't have an oral background, no hearing aid, no speaking at all. It was the first time that they seen a deaf person and it was a role model to them, right? They would say to me, wait a minute, you're deaf? And I would say, yeah, I'm deaf. They would take note that I didn't have a hearing aid. And they would say, but why don't you wear the hearing aid? And I would explain to them that really it's your choice uh, to use that. That's, that's a choice that you could make. And we did some art therapy together. They were all very moved by it. Uh, these were all eighth graders that were soon to be going into high school. Um, we were, because they were eighth graders, there was a lot of goofing around, a lot of silliness that went on. Um, and they would say to me, right, I, I want to be able to support my family, but I'm not Superman. And so I said, well, why not? Let's use our art and, and make yourself a superhero in that art. Uh, yeah. What does Superman have maybe that you don't have? Um, right, you, don't, you can't laser from your eyes. You don't have a shield or whatnot, but how what personality, what characteristics does Superman have that you can give to your family? Um, and they would say things like, I can support my mom, I can support my brother, I can support my sister. And just having these conversations on the playground or having the conversation sitting down, just drawing. Uh, when that internship was close to being over i got my thank you cards thank you so much for your time as an intern and i didn't expect the tears mm -hmm. um and i was told you know what you're my superman noel and that really hit that 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 very small moment made a huge impact for them um and that's still a moment that i carry with me deep in my heart that i will have with me forever um, that's the one thing that comes to mind right now when you ask that question. Mm, thank you for sharing that. It reminds me of um, that analogy about how when you throw a rock or a stone in the water and there's like a rippling effect, 
and how, especially for folks who are in eighth grade, who are at, and, and as young as that, that being able to share that experience, have that um, grounding and being able to inform actions like early, 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 that early in their life could really be transformative, especially as they understand how to better be a, a, a be a better ally and co-conspirator and um, uh, uh, and not only shape their own values and, and, and actions, but the relationships with other people and the institutions that they are a part of. Um, and um, and then especially around art, like I'm a dancer, so that's I. I I connect with folks through uh, through movement and, and and somatic and body work, and um, so you you talk you sharing that story reminded me of a story like, of being able to work with young people um, and dance as well, and um, how I, how it's important, um, especially as there's not as much access to art in schools in the same way because of funding and um, shift, different shifting priorities like being able to create and have more of these spaces even outside of a education or school context is so critical. Um, so I'm excited about learning about the work that you do and figuring out how do we ensure more people, especially at that young age, can get access to those kinds of programs and and, and just more in, in exposure to art. Absolutely. It's a sacred space. And it's an honor for me to be able to engage in those spaces. Um, that person that I shared, the one that was in middle school, was a black young boy. And I wonder sometimes, I wish that I can go back and see how they're doing today. But I mean, we didn't exchange information. Um, but they just had such a bright presence. And I know that there was so much potential in what they can offer to our world. Mm. Uh, same thing with dance. You think of a uh, spoken word too. Mm. Those moments that you just express and people come together to share in that expression. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate that schools don't have the funds for it at all times for dance, music, art. Um, it's, a, it's an important part of our lives. I absolutely agree that, that it does a lot for what type of dance do you, um, do you do? Yeah, so um, I was a trained hip hop dancer. Um, but one thing that I um, appreciated about the dancers um, that I was around is that they really tried to bring in a lot of our own culture in, into it. And so, for example, I'm, I identify as Filipino, Filipinex, and um, part of what our te our dance teachers and, and the dance instructors that um, I was trained with and around was how could we fuse or bring different cultures together so um, in our class we had we had actually a lot of diversity and so we would also do salsa and merengue, merengue and bangra and kind of learn about other cultures that way and then they would ask people from the community so they would say okay how would you for you Greg how would you connect Filipino or uh, Filipino traditional dance with hip hop and like, um, and so that was a way for us to like learn about other cultures, but also explore how we define some of these uh, culture for ourselves and our community for ourselves. Um, so I, 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 I appreciated those opportunities and especially in hindsight, like appreciated being able to have instructors that kind of pushed me to think about that and what that could look like and to have the agency to kind of come up with some things on my own and versus kind of just saying like, this is what you have to do and this is how you have to do it. That's a very good point. Very cool. Yeah. Um, my next question for you, Noelle, is, um, you know, what actually got you into this work? Like what, what did you always know gro growing up, this is what you wanted to do? Or was there anything in particular that made you say, oh, after this experience now, I, I really want to get into therapy. I really want to connect art. I would love to hear a little bit more about um, the, what got you on this path. Growing up, I've always loved art. Since day one, always an artist. Uh, so that's always been a part of me. 
I didn't know what I would do though, as you know, as an adult, I didn't think that I would be a full-time artist. I thought that that was like wishful thinking, um, that it would be difficult to be able to pursue that full time, but it is something right. That art was always a part of me. So I thought, okay, what if I was a graphic designer, but that means that I would be sitting at a computer all day, not for me. Uh, and then I had different friends that would say to me, you have such great advice, you're a great listener, have you ever considered being a counselor, a therapist? And I thought, no way, I'm going to sit down and just do paperwork all day long. No, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And so I thought, what, what do I want to do? Waiting for that spark. Um, I do really enjoy watching people, making connections. Uh, and then when I went to Gallaudet and I studied psychology um, and I saw all the different branches in psychology, there was family therapy, there was social work, um, just a lot of different branches. And so my teacher did say to me, did you know that there's art therapy? And I thought, wait a minute, that actually exists? It's a thing? I can probably then merge both of my interests. And then right there, that's where the spark came in. And I started to explore that as a possibility. Um, during, um, during DC, I did, um, Art Ables, Art Enables. It's a nonprofit organization in DC. This is where folks come together to put their, you just do art coming together. And so I really enjoyed that. And so I thought, okay, I cannot have my life without art. Um, and then I am interested in, you know, working with people. And so I just merged them together. Many deaf people, one thing that I noticed that go into psychology or into counseling or whatnot, um, and this doesn't apply necessarily to all of them, but this is just my observation, um, that it allows them to kind of see the bigger picture and things, to be able to express themselves. Um, that's kind of what I learned at, at Gallaudet. Um, and I thought, okay, we can also include art in this too. Um, I thought just to diversify what, what deaf people can offer. Um, there's some deaf people that don't necessarily learn English from the jump. And so they struggle with being able to express themselves. And I think that art is an opportunity where they don't necessarily have to use words, but they can still express themselves. This way there is no language barrier. Um, you're able to freely, uh, ab able to express yourself without the barrier of not, not having the proper words. Um, and so I love that I was able to, to uh, what's the saying, one, one bird or one stone or something. <laughs> yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And that last part you were just uh, describing around, um, uh, people being able to find different ways to express themselves, I think is such an important thing, even even as, as we're young, but also as we just be grow, as we, as we um, age and become adults, that um, sometimes it is easier to uh, drop, like make a, make a piece of art or do a dance or do something else that's not necessarily um, sharing words. Or maybe you share words through spoken word versus a conversation, um, and um, it, it 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 excites me to even think about that as someone who tries to bring folks together. How can we also support and create more opportunities for people to really um, uh, use different different elements and different aspects of the brain and uh, different um, tools to be able to express themselves. Um, and I, I, yeah, and I appreciate how you were able to find um, the the connection of this love for art and love for like supporting folks and listening to folks and being being able to kind of help pe guide folks into into a, 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 what it seems like a, something that brings you so much um, joy. So um, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Um, so as as uh, many folks know, May we're closing out um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and also Mental Health um, Awareness Month. And although um, at Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting, we like to say that we celebrate those things every day, every month, but use those moments as ways to help educate and lift up, um, especially for folks who maybe are newer, who, who may not necessarily have as um, uh, much knowledge about some of the issues or communities and how, we're, how folks are impacted. And so can you share with us what are ways that you have celebrated um, this month or what are what are examples of ways that you think folks could celebrate? As you mentioned, absolutely, we're celebrating every day. It's not just a once a month thing and then we're done with it. It's something that we can recognize and celebrate each day. If you look in your community, just finding um, Asian communities that you can support, different types of organizations, read their stories. I think that that's what, one way to get in tune with that community and a way to educate yourself, your children. Uh, there's information out there for myself. Absolutely, I'm celebrating all year long. It's a part of my life. Um, but I reach out to my friends, to my community uh, celebrate with them, discuss different types of issues. That's one way to celebrate. Um, also experiencing joy. The Asian community has faced a lot of unfortunate events uh, in the near recently, right? And so um, there was recently the new, the lunar Chinese year and the AAPI that community, there's so many layers, there's so many um, communities within the AAPI community. And so sometimes maybe we think about this one demographic, but then we forget about the Indian community, or we forget about this other Asian community. So I think it's important that we keep in mind all of them to celebrate. making those connections, donating funds if you can, um, but actually like action movements, not just sitting back and like watching these celebrations happening, but actually involve yourself in those celebrations. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, there's an Asian group that I follow. Finnish Eats. Finnish Eats uh, is a group that I follow. Asian deaf group, very much involved in social justice within the Asian community. I've been following them and learning a lot from following their page. Um, so if you, whoever's listening, if you have not discovered them yet, I absolutely recommend them. They're Asian signers deaf Asian community. Uh, there's a lot of other groups also that you can join, but that's one thing that I've done and I've been finding a lot of inspiration from that page. Um, I, I definitely understand and appreciate the, especially in the, the uh, helping people understand just how diverse and our communities are. Um, and one thing that I always talk with folks um, about is, you know, the Asian American community also, the API community also includes Southeast Asians, South Asians, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and it's important so to be able to ensure that we're also incorporating the, their experiences and um, uh, their perspectives and conversations and, um, you know, and because we're, we are so diverse, there is, sometimes I think it could feel like there is a, a lot for people to understand and learn. So I try to let folks know that it's like, there is no pressure to know everything all the time. And that that is that is the beauty I think for me is like, we can see it as an ongoing opportunity to, to your point, build and like learn from organizations, like get to know their stories, support them in different ways that you can. If you can't donate, is there, can you volunteer some time? Or can you, you maybe have some 
things that you can donate that are maybe they need it for their office or for an, uh, an event that they're going to do. Um, or maybe you can sign a petition that they have that is about getting more funding for particular communities or passing a piece of legislation, right? And so um, I um, try to like encourage folks that like this is, there is there is not like a certain amount that you learn and then you like know everything. Like I, I say that I'm a lifelong student and that there's kind of like always, there is always something I can learn or take from any per, any person that I meet or engage with. And so I, I try to offer that as a way to like, um, not feel overwhelmed by all of the things that they maybe do not know. And that it's, it's about just going at your pace, but to your going, connect, connecting this back to our conversation about accountability is how are you, you know, continuing on that journey and how are you continuing to, you know, support uh, meet new people and, and engage different organizations so that it's a it's ongoing versus feeling like you have to be complete or done in a in a given moment or after learning about a certain a certain amount of information. I agree with that point. You can give up your time. You can even sit and watch a documentary. A book, all of this counts. And as you said, lifelong learning. It is a journey that I'm also going through. Um, I was adopted very early on. I was five months old. I was raised by a white family, a uh, white deaf family, uh, and I absolutely adore my parents. Um, but I didn't learn about South Korea until my 20s, which means that I am still in that learning phase and I will always be in that learning phase. I stay open-minded, open heart. I feel that that is what gets you furthest along in life. Um, right, and I, I feel very similarly too that I also didn't know my Filipino history or more about my culture until much later and um, it was also part of why I felt so passionate about things like ethnic studies and gender studies because it gave me the context to, oh, this is not my fault that I don't know this. It's actually institutionalized racism and white supremacy and they actually don't teach us our histories on purpose. They don't want us to know how resilient our people are, how joyful our people are, how um, how we actually had self-determination and sovereignty um, before colonizers came and, and, and took over and um, uh, facilitated genocide and, and, and whatnot in, um, in many places. And so it's, um, for me, why it's an important part of how like, that's like learning and understanding that history is important because it, it, it reframed for me that like, okay, now that I know this and know that it's not necessarily my fault or even my parents' fault or family members' fault, it's actually it was actually institutionalized this way. How do we unroot that and challenge that and shift those um, or create new systems and structures that will allow for us to be able to um, be grounded in those ways or for folks to feel like they can be their most freest and truest and um, uh, whole selves. As I mentioned, um, I've had to, the, the unrooting of systems is, is, is difficult. And so we have to take celebratory moments, even in the little things, because it's going to be small steps and each one of those deserves its, its celebratory moment. Mm -hmm. Coming together in solidarity with our black and brown community members uh, in consideration of like a better future for ourselves. Absolutely. Um, I, if it's okay, I'm going to shift a little bit and talk about um, more about some of the arts work um, and the, the creative expression work that you do. Um, you know, because, you know, at, at Can't Stop One Stop Consulting, we believe. Um, we talk about what we believe in increasing access and advancing disability justice and really intentionally incorporating arts and culture and even healing practices into all that we do. Um, and um, and we, I know we talked a little bit about this, but would love to hear a little bit more about um, how, you know, 
what role has art played in your own life and um, why is it important to what you are saying to really do what brings you light and joy and, and happiness, um, especially in, I, uh, in what I feel like is very challenging times right now? It absolutely is. Um, let me think. Art keeps me rooted, keeps me grounded. It's an escape for me at times. It gives me a uh, respite from the rest of the world. It's like an escape of everything that's going on where I can just be with myself, no judgment. Um, I'm able to express whatever comes to my heart. Growing up, art was always a part of me. Um, different medias, photography at one point, paint, watercolors. When I was a teenager, it was a lot of photography. And the reason that I think that I was so involved with photography was because it gave me connection to people. Uh, right, you get them in digital format and you're able to share them with people. So that was able to put me in community. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with Live Journal. That's something that I used back when I was a teen, way before Facebook, way before Instagram, all the social media platforms that we have. I was very much involved, uh, very much used Live Journal. Uh, discovered my queer identity. Art has really helped me uh, express myself and connect with other people. Um, art has helped me release just different parts of my own identity, discover my identity. Um, I think of Frida, Frida Kahlo, who's a role model of mine. I feel very much connected with their work. I see it as a, a, a healing tool. I had my deaf parents growing up, which means that I always had communication access. I always had access to language and I can see that that's a privilege of mine. Um, but I didn't have access to my Asian community. I didn't have access to my, my queer identity. Um, and I think that, that having art helped me find those people, um, get to a place where I, I truly love myself, Um, I can also acknowledge that not all community members have the luxury of taking the time to find their healing, making the space for that. I recognize that that's a privilege that I have. Our therapy is not always accessible. We, there's a lot of barriers, language barriers, health insurances and whatnot that prevent people from, from getting these tools. It's a struggle sometimes, even if, if you do get it and you have to use your words, but if you didn't have the language, then it's difficult for you to be able to express yourself. Um, and then when you have these barriers, right, you're experiencing these, it's like a double trauma. You're just being re-traumatized again. You're trying to express yourself, but then there's barriers to be able to do that. So that you're, it's just double the, tra the tr uh, doubling the trauma. Um, but I love that there's play therapy, art therapy, music therapy, all the different types of ways that we're able to express ourselves. Um, nature therapy. I think it, 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 you just have to be able to speak to a person's soul to help a person get to that healing space. Uh, marginalized community, black and brown communities, they experience so much oppression. And so how can we release that? How can we help them release that? Um, and so I think about alternative therapies to, to help these communities get through that. Uh, you know, as you were sharing that, one thing that comes up for me is, you know, as especially as we're also kind of thinking about Mental Health Awareness Month, um, if, if, if someone is tuning into this conscious conversation and they're saying, okay, wow, no, no, what, what Noelle is saying is really compelling and I really want to figure out how do I help increase access to these alternate alternative therapies? 
increase access to art therapy, music therapy, et cetera. What are, what are recommendations you have for folks who are wanting to take action or feel called to action based on this conversation? That's a challenging question, for sure. I wish that I had a magic wand that would just uh, magically uh, create a solution for us, but there is no magic wand. Uh, for people that want to learn more, I would uh, start at the school system, give access to children, uh, because it could be done through play therapy, it could be done through art, and then um, encourage even the, the college system. Mm -hmm. Let's not just follow the traditional approach to therapy, uh, the old theory, old philosophy. Think about what's, what's currently available in the world. What does the world need? What do communities need? Open these doors, these opportunities. Um, I I think that a door is also me sharing my experience so that people know that that it's that it's available. Um, I think we need to challenge the current systems that we have in place. Um, having that open door will allow for other people to come through that door and i can't do we, we there's no way that i can do this by myself we need to come together work together um find people that are like-minded and their passion and want to transform the world i believe there's three to five deaf art therapists in my program right now and that's very exciting for me that potential that's available, these doors that are going to open up for for the, the five of us. We need allies. All bodies, basically, to come together to create this transformation, to dismantle the current systems that we have in place and continue educating. Um, do you have any recommendations of organizations or groups that are trying to increase either funding or access to these uh, different kinds of therapy that you would offer or recommend folks check out? There are many organizations. Nothing coming. The one that comes to mind right now is Signed. Signed by Stories. That's an organization that has just come up, and this is their sign with a uh, uh, closed fist, open hand um, at the chest. Those that. Um, have experienced therapy and stuff, they come and they, they share their stories, um, offer different types of resources. That's that's an organization that just popped up a few months ago. Um, February, I think. Another one that comes to mind, uh, organization. There's several out there. That's the one though that, that comes to mind right now. Um, but when I think of them, I can send them. I can send them your way. Okay, no worries. I feel like this is a good start. Yeah. Um. So the. I was just trying to think of of something else. Mental health services. There's National Deaf Therapist (NDT). Deaf Therapy Center. Just depends on what what works best for the person's preference. Uh, I mentioned Finnish Eats. That's the Asian group um, that offers a lot of resources. I would definitely recommend checking that out. But there's a lot of organizations um, that you can tap into. Um, yeah. 
have deaf therapists, lots of, lots of organizations that we have um, available for us to check out. Thank you for sharing those resources. Um, we'll be sure to check them out and also try to um, offer, share them out as well. Um, but I have two final questions for you. Uh, the first question I would love to ask is, um, if you can think about the younger Noel, is there any advice you would offer them after, you know, looking back and after kind of living life and doing what you've been able to do? Is there any advice that you would offer to uh, little Noel? I love these questions that have you connect to your inner child. I would say don't give up, Noel. There will be some barriers and frustrations. Um, I wish that that Noel would have understood that there was going to be system barriers. Um, you have permission to explore your Korean identity, your South Korean identity. Um, I do wish that that was available earlier on. Where I grew up in Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, it was tough to explore my identity, my queer identity, my South Korean identity, because the community, it was just a different culture. Um, you can be gentle with yourself, Noel. Be curious. Uh, don't dismiss your curiosity. There's a picture that I have of myself back when I was in college. Um, it was a 360, it was 365, uh, 365 pictures that were taken I can't, rem I can't remember how many days I actually did, but it was on the 30th day of taking the, the pictures, the 365 days of, of self-portraits. Um, my mindset was at the time, like, who cares what happened in prior generations or back in the days? Like, who cares? What, what is right now is enough. Um, but when I did the, um, I was a part of, um, when I was doing the internship, there was a big Asian community and they invited me to the festival and there was some um, Korean food there. And I got a taste of Korean food and it, I felt that that moment, just the food opened up my mind and my heart. But, and, and there was just this moment of like, who cares what was before? And then this like moment where I was like, I actually do care of what was before. Yeah. Um, and then, like you said, it's not my parents' fault. It was a system that we were working working against. Um, so I would say to little Noel, explore, continue, explore, 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 explore. Thank you. Um, uh, let, I hope that we can take the advice you gave to little Noel and all. And I feel like even there's things, that, helpful for, reminders for me even now as I continue to um, navigate life and all that it all the things that comes along with that um and, and may more young people and youth um tap into that and feel that in, in it, wherever they're at they are so my final question for you noel is um are there any particular campaigns or projects that you're working on that you want people to know about or um, are there ways that people can support you I mentioned earlier that um, I'm a part of um, Signed by Stories. That's a small project that I am I'm linked into and I'm exploring more of just listening to different deaf stories uh, to help with healing. Um, my goal is to have open access for um, mental health services to help eliminate some of those barriers. Um, 
people who maybe are interested in art so creating like some type of directory so this way people are not scrounging of, of where these therapists exist but creating some type of directory um so that it's easier to find therapists that are offering the type of therapy that you are looking for at this moment there's one or two of us available right now uh, and i'm hoping to be able to expand that more deaf therapists professionals alternative therapy uh that type of thing uh, that's something that I'm that I'm pushing, and so that's a way to support me is to follow follow that page. Um, keep your mind open to the possibility of having that door open, so that the next person, the next deaf person that wants to offer that type of of service, that the door is open for them. Um, yeah, and remain curious. That is a way that you can me what my goals are. I am open for uh, the, to offer whatever I can to the community in whatever capacity I can. So if a future project comes up, I am game for it. I love connection. Please reach out to me. Absolutely. Well, um, I am excited and um, I won't share too much now and I'll follow up with you, but um, Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting has been working on a project it's been behind the scenes and we're preparing to launch it in the next couple of months. Um, we've, been, we've been working with Melissa, our, our accessibility coordinator and a, a partner organization that's specifically about um, increasing resources um, for, to increase access to mental health um, and particularly focusing on deaf and deaf blind and hard of hearing communities. This is great. So it sounds like there is a particular and um, and particularly um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color and LGBTQ um, IA folks or identified folks. And so it sounds like there is some um, synergy and some opportunity for further collaboration. So I, I will commit to following up and um, look forward to continued building um, and appreciate what you also offered. And you have my ongoing commitment to stay curious, to figure out how to increase access as much as possible and um, creating more conversations like this that lift up the stories of different folks um, everywhere. So thank you again. Of course, one more thing that I would like to add. Uh, deaf woke wellness, deaf woke wellness. That is also something that has just come up and it's led by um, Vanna. <coughs> they would um, like to also, they're thinking about the wellness of our BIPOC community. And so that is an idea when you just mention that of something that you can also collaborate with. Um, very excited of of what's to come and thank you so much for inviting me i very much enjoyed connecting with you uh this topic is something that we do need to talk about more and so i appreciate you having me thank you also for the interpreter uh and happy late birthday to you greg thank you so much i really appreciate that um I, of course i just want to make sure to give a shout out to melissa who is our accessibility coordinator and who helps us with all of our um thank you melissa and um also thank you of course to jessica for being the interpreter for this particular event um and as a our as our ongoing commitment we host conscious conversations um and all of our conscious conversations moving forward will have a, a american sign language interpreter so um that is a commitment that we we have at can't stop one stop consulting so thank you for being our featured guest today um, Noel, and um, I know this. I know that there's going to be a lot more building and continued community. So look for, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. <clears throat> Having accessibility for everyone is an absolute, absolute need. Good evening to everyone. Take care, y'all. Thank you.